had a little battle with my mask and uh, was wanting to hang on to my face. We've been wearing it for so long and uh, yeah, I heard the groaning over here. <laughs> uh, this has been like a crazy season like I don't think every one of us have ever lived through and um, it's the reality of where we're at right now, isn't it? And I think uh, one of the greatest dangers is that we, uh, can, one of the greatest things that can keep us from growing spiritually and really going ahead in our faith, in our walk with God, you know what it is? Anxiety. Some of us in this room, and maybe even you're listening online, you struggle greatly with anxiety. And when COVID hit, it just took it to another level, Right? I refuse to believe that our best years are yet ahead. That God is working even in the midst of this crazy season. That God is moving under the ground. That God is moving even though the trees look dead. Even though life around us looks dead. Even though the future looks dead. I believe God has a plan. This is not surprise God. But here's the problem. When it comes down to it, I don't know if you've ever, we, we all, we're emotional beings, aren't we? we? We have emotions. And there's great things that you and I face. But all throughout scripture, God always, one message I keep hearing over and over again throughout scripture as I read it, is be strong, be courageous, don't be anxious for anything. Jesus said these words, don't be anxious for anything, uh, and then even the Apostle Paul in this letter that we've been writing, we come to this place. And the letter that he's writing to, uh, to the Philippian believers. And he brings up this whole area of anxiety and fear. Uh, basically anxiety. And the, they did a Barna study recently. And in that study, they, they, this is what they found out, especially restoring relationships. It says anxiety and depression are the most commonly experienced challenges to relational satisfaction. With more than one-third of all adults and practicing Christians saying one or the other or both make an impact on their close relationships. So if you struggle with anxiety and fear, it's going to be hard for you to uh, live a healthy, productive life. Because here's the thing with anxiety. It, it's, it's one of the greatest thieves. One of the greatest thieves that steals joy, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And so the reality is, how do we manage this? I've titled this message, how do I process anxiety in my life? How do I process anxiety in my life? For some of you, you need to hear this message because it will change the direction of your life. It will change the course of your life. It will free you, free you to be able to be a person that enjoys God. Instead of it being always paranoid and worried and anxious about many things. Um, the big idea is as we become more like Christ, it is vital that we learn how to process anxiety and fear in our lives in a faith-filled and life-transforming way. And the passage that we're looking at today is Philippians 4. Starting with verse 2, the Apostle Paul uh, jumps into this. But here's a problem. Through COVID, we've seen 53% of adult Americans claim that their mental health had been negatively affected in 2020. I don't know about you, but for a while there, I, I found myself in that process, like mm, coming out of the water. Mm. And here's some practices, just very practical things I've done. I don't watch the news anymore. I don't. I used to want to watch the 10 o'clock news. But then what the problem was, I'd fall asleep to the news. And I don't know about you, but all I hear is bad news. 
And with the COVID situation that we had and the political unrest and all the crazy 2020 year that we wanted to beat up like a piñata at the very end. I did. I don't know about you. The reality is it's affected us. People sheltering in place reported higher levels of stress and worry, 40% over COVID-19, than people who were not sheltering in place, 37%. So those who were sheltering in place, they, they felt greater anxiety and fear than those who actually were out and about a little bit. Not necessarily not being careful, but they were out there. They got out of their the, the rut of seclusion. Anxiety disorders affect 40 million U.S. adults every year. 31.2% of Americans experience an anxiety disorder at some point in their lifetime. Over 90% of people with generalized anxiety disorder have another psychiatric diagnosis as well. 19 million Americans suffer from specific phobias. I don't know about you, there's a crisis and the problem is it's not just in the world out there. It's, it's in the, the heart of believers. I want you to ask yourself a question as we jump into this. How is your anxiety level? How is your fear level? How is your faith? Jesus speaking to his disciples right before he went to the cross, he said these words to them in the last discourse or the last message that he had to his disciples that is recorded, it says this in John 14, 27. Peace I live, leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Did you hear those words? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, all of us need to take responsibility, I believe, for the peace that we need and stop being victims of our fear and anxiety. Some of us say, well, that's my personality. You've been doing this all your life. You've been, you've been fearful all your life. You've been a fearful person since the day that you remember. You've been anxious about many things. And see, anxiety changes. And what we, what we experience and what we're focused on with our anxiety, it changes throughout our life. But the fact is, is anxiety something that God desires for our life? Obviously, Jesus spoke against it. He said, don't, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear or what you're going to clothe yourself with. He says, but, uh, but, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. See, we're talking in the context of the fact that we have a God who loves us deeply, he loves you so deeply. And you can, you, can, you can be assured that he loves you, and he's not just about love talk. He loves you, but he will prove his love. He's already proved it through one big way, is that fact that he went to the cross for you. He died on the cross because that was the only way that you could be brought into a relationship with him. He shed his own blood. He came to this earth fully God, and fully man. In the same passage that we're reading today, Philippians 4, verse 9, I kind of wanted to go to that verse because I want you to t think about this whole area of anxiety in a, in a practical way of how do we deal with it? How do we get out of this rut? How do we change our anxiety into peace? How do we receive God's peace, the peace that Jesus said, I offer you, I give this peace to you, I give it to you like the world doesn't give it to you. How many of the world, think about it, the world does nothing. You know, when it comes down to they can give us false assurances of the future, but not even, nobody in this world can actually determine the future. Only God can. God knows the future. He knows what's ahead. In fact, that's why COVID didn't catch him by surprise. But the Apostle Paul says this in verse 9, he says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. If you could get all along of those last few words, put it into practice. Put it into practice. Turn to the person next to you and say, put it into practice. See, I, a long time ago when I was in Bible school, uh, Dr. Sweeting uh, was uh, an amazing man of God and and he would always say this, discipline, not desire, determines destiny. 
I think that's so powerful for us to understand. You might have a desire to grow in your faith. You might have a desire to, 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 to go and, and, and grow in your faith and become and do amazing things for God. But here's the problem. Your desire is good, but your desire doesn't determine your destiny. It's your discipline. Put it into practice. Put it into practice. So what are the things we must put into practice that will allow us to experience true peace in our lives? I want to talk to you today about four habits you will need to begin to practice so that you can experience true peace. Let's jump into the passage. In uh, verse 2 of chapter 4 of Philippians, it says this. I plead with you, Eodia, and I plead with you, Syntyche, to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Now, it's kind of interesting that the Apostle Paul, in addressing this area of, of anxiety, starts with, relationships there happened to be two sisters in the church who weren't getting along and they're busted out for all eternity in scripture it's a one way that you can get into the bible back then just don't get along i mean these were not just any kind of women these were eodia and syntyche now these are busted out names i can't wait to see meet eodia and syntyche in heaven, Eodia and Syntyche had a problem. We don't know what the problem was. We didn't, they weren't getting along. They were disagreeing about something. There was friction in the church. But I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I, I'm sure you've never experienced that before. I remember I, when I was younger, I had a lot more pride in my life. God has chipped a lot of things off my life. But a long time ago, I remember I was in a service. I was in a pastor. I didn't have the title of pastor. Let me put it that way. I already, God probably had given me gifting already. But I was just a guy, a young guy, and I had this guy who, he was a, a friend. And so I invited him to church, and I felt this competition with him for some reason. And so we had a lot of friction. He was very stubborn. Notice how I put he was very stubborn. I guess we were both very stubborn. But this man, his name was John Bartos, a good friend of mine. He actually is now with the Lord. Same age, I mean, young guy. He, he passed away young. And, 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 but at the end, we, we, we still had this friendship still all the way along. But in the middle of the service, like what would happen, though, is I would come to church. And, and you know, have you ever friction, had a friction with some, a disagreement with somebody? And then when you come to church, you still know that you had to be here. But uh, at church, and so, but we would see each other, and I would see him, and he would see me, but he would be talking to somebody else. But I know he saw me out of the corner of his eye. I did. And I would act like I had to go somewhere else. I acted busy to get away from him. And I felt like he did the same thing. And so we, were, we would kind of come in, but we would not, we would not greet each other with a, Big hug, you know, now the new hugs are these, you know. Uh, we, 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 we didn't greet each other that way, you know. Uh, we, we, but, you know, we kind of acknowledge, but there was this friction, tension. And here's the problem with tension. We think that it's okay to have tension like that. No, no, it's not. They were not getting along. These two sisters were not getting along. And what happens is we would avoid each other. And there was this, 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 this uh, atmosphere that was being created with division or even disagreements. It, the thick was the air was thick there. You think that you and your wife are having problems and, and the kids don't know anything about it. Listen, don't be gullible to think that they don't know. You create a tension, you create an atmosphere when they're not getting along. And the Apostle Paul just busts them out and said, Listen, I wish that these two sisters you would get together, that you would work things out, that you would love each other the way that Christ has asked us to love each other. And we don't know what the agreement was about, but the problem is that relationships are huge. Relationships are huge in helping you get beyond the anxiety because it's through relationships that anxiety is expressed. We are anxious about relationships. When we're not getting along, it becomes and it creates and intensifies a, 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 a hardness or a difficulty in relationships. During the same Barna report that was restoring relationships is called, he says this, relationships are under pressure. 
This pressure is new, and it's unique in human history. Squeezed between massive changes in communication technologies, diminishing religious influence, hyper-individualized morals, and sexual ethics and extreme cultural and political polarization, the strain on our everyday relationships is mounting. And it's not always clear to people where they can turn for help. Did you hear that? There's, it's mounting. The pressure is getting greater. It's no wonder that it's harder to get along with people right now. It's harder to deal with relationships. It's no wonder that marriages, I heard a statistic, that marriages right now are, 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 are having, and there's greater divorce happening with couples because of the pressure that is mounting. And in the midst of this, the Apostle Paul goes right to the heart of it. He confronts it right where it's at. Listen, sisters, get along. And he invites other people to get involved in the solution to the disagreement. Verse 2, I plead with you and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Uh, this is, is the wrong way to get into the Bible, but they actually focused on it. Who have contended at my sides for the gospel. These were not just women. They were ministers. They, they ministered strongly for the Lord. They had probably reached people for Christ. They had discipled people. They were strong women of God. But they had a problem. They couldn't get along. Um, and, and he's asked them to step up to the plate. But see, with this John Bartos, going back to that story, you know what happened? I was in the middle of a service. I'm sitting there trying to worship because, see, I, I, I think the thing to realize is if you don't have good relationship this way, it's going to affect this. You kind of wonder why you're stuck in your spiritual life. Maybe you're not getting along with somebody. Maybe you have unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody else because it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work to have good relationships here unless your relationship here is right. And this, this one affects this one as well as this one affects this one. And so I, I want to challenge you that you would evaluate. But what in the middle of the service, getting back to that story, I keep going back to that story and getting off the tire. In that service, I found myself in that service, and it was during the time of worship, in the middle of the service. And I felt the Holy Spirit just say, go talk to John Bartos. He wasn't even at church. Go talk to John Bartos. And I, it was like that thing when you knew that the Lord was convicting me so strongly. And so I turned over to my wife, Elizabeth, says, I got to go. I said, what? She said, I got to go make this right. So I drove all the way to Berwyn. And I went to his house, basement house. I knocked on the window because he didn't have a doorbell. And he looked up and he goes, oh, no. And came out. But I said, I am so sorry for these attitudes that I've had to you. Will you please forgive me? And you know what? We prayed together. But see, when you do that, God honors that. We became friends because of that. We have became not only friends, but brothers. See, there's no such thing as bearing anger alive. It grows underground. If you're angry towards somebody else, if you have disagreement, it's going to be working underground, growing roots that will eventually take over your life. How many know wherever there's a problem, there's a root? And sometimes it's a spiritual matter. And in this case, it was a relationship. And what, what did the relationship dysfunction create in this disagreement? It created stress. You find yourself worrying about relationships. You find worship, worrying about each other. Uh, and, and they find so. So is there a person in the church that you are having a hard time agreeing with or getting along with? Let's, let's apply it. I want you to think about that person. Have you learned how to agree in the Lord about your disagreement. Notice what he, the Apostle Paul says. He says, don't just agree to agree. He said, agree in the Lord. That phrase in the Lord, you see it throughout Scripture. That's super powerful. You know why? Because what, you, what he's saying is this. Hey, you can agree about different things, but when you do it in the Lord, it's not what you want or I want. What does God want? You know, that's helping my wife and I so much because it's not about what I think or what she thinks. And we ask ourselves, God, what do you think? And then we submit ourselves to what he thinks, and then we're good. You know why we're good? Because ultimately he's in charge. And when we don't agree upon different things, we have to ask ourselves, 
Are we doing this in the Lord? We need to agree upon this in the Lord, in the Lord. What does God say about it? What does God's word say about it? So one of the things we need to ask ourselves in application, what does God say about what you are disagreeing about in his word? You know, there's a lot of cultural shifts right now in our culture. There could be a lot of disagreements in this. It's not about what the culture thinks or what I think about it. What does God say about it is ultimately what we need to stand on because we're followers of Jesus. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus, that's what we need to stand on, his word, his written word. Now I know that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes. But the reality is this. One day we'll know everything. While we're here, we have to trust God's word and his Holy Spirit leading us. And also as a church, if we can't get along in the church, how do we think that we're going to be able to reach people for Christ? There are things that we have disagreed upon before with different people. And when we think about it, don't you look back at some of those situations and say, that was ridiculous. That was so ridiculous. How could we ever go down that road? So the first thing that we need to do is to practice releasing relational anger and resentment quickly. Practice releasing relational anger and resentment quickly. So not only that, but secondly, another basically habit you and I will need to begin to practice so that we can experience this true peace that Jesus offers is this. Practice celebrating your life in God and acknowledge his presence continually. Practice celebrating your life in God and acknowledge his presence continually. The Apostle Paul says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I, wa I want you to think about this. Did you see something that he already had said? A phrase. In the Lord. So get along in the Lord. Get along in the Lord. He also says rejoice in the Lord. Now that is powerful because see he, what he's saying is, listen, through Jesus in our relationship with him, we can find this peace. Jesus said, I give you this peace. My, my, my peace I give to you, not like the world gives. Um, but we can find and we find our joy not in the world, not in the circumstances that we're in, but in the Lord. Are you practice celebrating your life in God? It's, are you thankful that God saved you? Are you thankful that he rescued you? Are you thankful that he's opened up your eyes? Not everybody sees, my friend. It's the work of God that opens your eyes to see his goodness and his graciousness. His love and his uh, care for your life. It's, it's, it's him that opens up our eyes. And, and so as we go through circumstances, instead of getting anxious or fearful or falling into the trap of, of going to that place, he, he's, he's saying this basically. Set your thermostat. You know how many of you have thermostats in your house? Everybody should be. No trick, trick question. You should all raise your hand. Even online. You should be raising your hand. Yeah, there we go. See, with a thermostat, you set the temperature. And what he's saying, listen, set your gauge to what? Find joy in no matter what circumstance you're going through. I'm not saying joy, joy and happiness are not equal. Happiness is like, oh, I find my happy. Oh, I feel so, I feel this emotion of happiness. And before we were saying, you know, now with the mask, you can't see if somebody's smiling. Oh, I can see if somebody's smiling. You can tell in the eyes. <laughs> eyes communicate a lot. You know, you're smiling. Your eyes are smiling. They're sparkling. But he says, find your joy in the Lord. Preset the setting like a temperature of setting your joy in God. Finding it only in him. Not in anything else. And, and he says this, let your gentleness be reasonableness be evident to all that word gentleness indicates readiness to listen and reason a yielded disposition a yielded heart to the lord and coming into a circumstance situation where maybe disagreeing with somebody else relationally 
you kind of come in with that yielded heart to say, it's not about what does God say about this? We're doing it in the Lord, but I also want to find my joy in the Lord. Um, the spirit that is reasonable, fair-minded, and charitable is what it means. And, and I love this because it says the Lord is, why should we do this? Is because the Lord is what? Far away in heaven, doesn't care about your situation. The Lord is what? Near. He's near. Now, that could mean two things. The believers of the New Testament strongly believed that Jesus could return at any time. They've lived with this idea of that Jesus could return. He's coming. And we should be waiting. We should be expecting. We should be uh, uh, looking for his return. So there is that sense of, mer the word is Maranatha. So the word is that, like, we, we, we should be with expectancy. But in my experience, I remember when I started really understanding, I realized, God, you are here with me. It's not just that I'm looking forward to you coming and I'm expecting you coming. You are near me. You're not this God far away that doesn't care about my little intricate life. Oh, God is the creator of the universe, but he cares intimately and distinctly about your life, your situations, your circumstances. He cares about how you're going through life. He cares that you would be find your peace and joy in him and not in this world. Not being caught up in the anxiety and the fear that you can be produced. Have you learned to find your joy in God no matter what is going on around and inside you? Does the truth that Jesus' return is imminent and that he is with you give you peace? The fact that he's there. I, I you know, and, and here's the thing. You're going to go through anxious thoughts. And even no matter how much you and how long you walk with the Lord, you're going to face it. I've seen my wife, and I, I'm going to put her a little bit, tell her story, but I mean, several years back when we were like in a, in a different circumstance situation, uh, it was with, uh, I can't remember what season it was, but her anxiety and fear was around the future of our kids. And so she would lose sleep and she was, she was grinding and she, her, you know, she was, her well, the teeth grinding was way back, but uh, just she found herself not being able to sleep at night. Sleepless nights, and, and, and she was wrestling through, but God began to teach her that you have to do something about it. You can't just say, well, I trust you, God, or, or God, and it's not just one time thing. You just can't just pray about it and say, okay, God, here it is. No, it's a process. It's a process that you have to go back and set your thermostat over and over again to the reality that God is good. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. It's, it's not like... It's not like you're going to cast your cares on, 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 on Christ one time and it's over. You, you and I have to constantly care, cast our cares because the way life is, you're going to have circumstances that change. How many of you, you, you hear one bad news and boom, it's, it's like changes your emotions. Your emotions come, the fears come right away. Fear comes and creeps in and starts taking over our life. It's a process that we need to go through. And this is where we see the Apostle, the Apostle Paul uh, go into next. Look what he says in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that he says... Do not be anxious about anything. Anything means nothing. That there is no permission to be anxious about anything. Are you following me? Next time you need to catch yourself. Find, see, some of us, we're, we're so much in that trench that we don't even think we're worrying. We don't realize we're anxious. And so we find ourselves in this tra train, it's almost like a train track. That you've been going on this train track for so long, it's like, chuk, 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 chuk. Woo -hoo. Chuk, 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 chuk. And this is your this is your your default mode. This is what you do. This is this is your and and all your family knows. Oh, she's just an anxious anxious person. Oh, he's just an anxious person. And what is the apostle Paul challenging? He says he says don't be 
He says, don't be anxious about what? Anything. But, he says, I love that there's always a but there. In everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So here is therefore the process that the Apostle Paul is saying. I believe the Apostle Paul practiced this. That's why later on he says in that verse that we looked at in verse 9, whatever you see me do, whatever you, whatever you heard from me, whatever you have seen in me, uh, put it into practice. Put it into practice. And what does it do? You take your anxious thought and you bring it and you translate it before God into a prayer and a petition with thanksgiving to God. I love that hymn that says, what a friend we have in Jesus. And this is the words that it says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I really believe if we could boil this down, I think the greatest problem in the church today is that people don't pray. When we don't pray, what we're saying is I'm depending more on myself than on God. When I pray, I'm saying, God, I need you. I depend on you. I can't do life without you. I need you. I need you to come into my circumstances. Didn't Jesus say, our Father who art in heaven? He says, how, how should we pray, Jesus? His disciples, teach us how to pray. And he says, this is the pattern that you should pray in. The pattern. This is not the words that you should necessarily say, but it's a pattern. He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We need to lift our eyes up to the reality that when you're anxious, realize that God is in control. He's super God. He's powerful. He's almighty. There's nothing that he cannot do. There's nothing impossible for God. And what does he say? Our Father who art, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. In other words, you're saying is your rule. Come here, Lord. I invite you, your kingdom to come, Lord Jesus. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, align what's happening in my life right now with your perfect will in heaven. Let it become one. Let it become aligned. And you and I need to learn how to cast our cares upon him, uh, cast our anxiety and fear upon him. Why? Why, why should be the motivation? Because he cares for you. He cares so deeply for you. Every time you, you get, you get anxiety, anxious and you, you become overwhelmed with anxiety and fear, what you're doing is you say, God, I trust myself and my circumstances and my ability to deal with it. Then I do trust you, God. But notice that he says as we translate this anxiety and fear and bring it into a petition or prayer before the Lord or supplication, oh, we have to be specific with those. Bring it with thanksgiving. So this, this throw a bunch of thanksgiving in it. Notice, load it up with thanksgiving. Some of you, when you eat ice cream, you put little ice cream or... Maybe you put a lot of ice cream, but then sometimes you put so much stuff on it. It just covers everything else. You know what? That should be Thanksgiving. Put a bunch of it on. Get a big bowl. Get a mixer bowl. <laughs> put it in there, man. Put a little bit of, put a, a lot of stuff on there. Just load it up with Thanksgiving. When you bring your petitions and your, your, your supplications before God, Throw a lot of thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I think thanksgiving is like the Teflon for anxiety. Keeps it away, man. Drives it away. Doesn't let it stick to your soul. Doesn't let it rob your sleep. 
Why? Because you are trusting God. And what does it do? There's a promise. And the peace of God. And the peace of God. And the shalom of God, which transcends all human understanding. In other words, we can't even comprehend it. Will guard your hearts. Notice where he starts. Your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you see how it's put it into practice type of things? What are the effects of peace, God's peace? God's peace gives health to your body. Proverbs 14.30 says a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. God's peace also drives out fear and anxiety. John 14.27, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. God's peace helps you make clear decisions. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Notice that, ru- that word rule is like an umpire. I'll never forget playing kickball over here in the, in the field over there. And we had one of the best umpires in the world, <laughs> Brother John. John was like, a, like that, man. He was like a ruling. Mm. And why is it so important to have a good umpire? Because let him rule. You let the umpire make the decision. And when it comes down to it, uh, we need to allow God to allow Christ to rule in our hearts and let him be the umpire. Because what happens is sometimes we have anxious thoughts and, 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 and again, we find ourselves trapped. We find ourselves being robbed of our joy, robbed of our peace. And God is saying, listen, the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, I want you to go beyond that because God provides a peace. When he's promised you to give us peace, he'll give it to us. But we got to put it into practice. We got to put it into practice. And what will happen, there's a great reward. God will guard your heart to mind in Christ Jesus. The idea of that is that God was going to set a military guard around our minds. It's almost like picture of, of a, a, a guarding, soldiers guarding, that nothing can penetrate your mind in Christ Jesus. Um, Notice that it says in Christ Jesus. Again, this is in Christ, not a mental exercise or some kind of mind trick, but rather a spiritual benefit provided by our relationship with Christ. Just the fact that you and I are in Christ, we have the benefit of being him ruling in our hearts uh, as Lord and King. So not only some, some habits, practice releasing relational anger and resentment quickly, Practice celebrating life in God and acknowledge his presence continually. Thirdly, learn to practice stress-releasing prayer. And fourthly, as we wind down, practice the habit of thinking in the light. Verse 8. In verse 8, we say, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Notice that he says, finally, brothers, is Paul's conclusion thoughts on the subject of anxiety and fear. What is he saying here? Uh, Basically says, whatever is true, as opposed to false or deceitful, if there's anything false or deceitful, don't focus on that. But whatever is true, whatever is noble, worthy of honor or dignified, uh, whatever is right, the idea of just, whatever is just, focus on those things. Whatever is pure, that means unpolluted, that there's no stain of pollution. Whatever is lovely, pleasing, attractive, evokes worship. Whatever is, is a pleasing and attractive, focus on what is lovely, admirable. Whatever is admirable, of good report, well spoken of. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, in other words, whatever we find virtue or excellence in any area, we need to focus on those things. So this idea now is... Remember I talked about a little bit about the train track. When you're on a train and you want the train to go a different direction, you have a, a basically a, the railroads have like a, a, a train track, I don't know what they call it, but a redirect switch. Some of us need to redirect big time. You've been on this track all your life. This is you say, well, this is who I am. This is how I, I think. This is how I process life. And God is saying, no, no, no. We need to, the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, no, no. Do something different here. Put another train. Now, he's not obviously speaking about trains. Don't get me wrong. They didn't have trains back then. But what he's saying is, listen, you and I need to, in our thinking, 
in our thought, thinking, don't allow anything in your mind, because what's in your mind will affect your heart, and vice versa, right? What you allow to think about, what you allow your mind to think about, that's why when I stop looking at the news, I have great peace. Because I'm not thinking about who got shot where. And I'm not thinking about hoodlums that are coming in to, uh, and going to rob my garage. Why? Am I aware of things? Oh, absolutely. But I'm not focused on it. I'm focusing on God. I'm focusing on his word. I'm reading God's word in the morning, and then throughout the day, I, I, I bring my anxious thought. When I feel an anxious thought coming in, I, 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 this is what I try to do. I try to say, God, okay, this is what I'm feeling. I want to redirect this, and, I, and I'm going to now thank you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you, and I'm going to take this fear, and I'm going to make it a prayer to you. I'm going to make this and turn this into a prayer that I can bring before you, and I can leave it at your feet. And I can thank you that you love me and care for me so much that you got this, God. And I leave it at your feet. I, I, just, I just cast it on your shoulders, God. You got big shoulders, God. I'm putting them on your shoulders, God. Maybe you have a fear of, of somebody in your life. You, you have a fear of what's going to happen to your children. Are they going to get accepted at school? Lord, you know what need to, you know exactly what you're your, your, where my son or daughter needs to go to school. Oh, God, you know. You have a plan for their life. God, you love them more than I could ever love them. I hand them and I hand the situation into your hands, God. I cast it on you. And, oh, you might have to do it over and over again. Because that fear is going to come back. That anxiety is going to come back. But I'm going to bring it to you. What thoughts do you need to redirect or experience God's peace in? What are the thoughts that you are right now battling with, with anxiety and fear? Some of us are consumed by fear right now in anxious thoughts. I want to challenge you that you would learn to change it, redirect it. Philippians 4, 9, like he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice. And then he says this. He gives another promise. And the God of peace will be with you. A, a good illustration of this is, you know, on, on the TV, we all have TVs in our house, right? Most, mostly. You have a TV. Now, you cannot control what's on the TV. But you can change the channel. You have a remote control. Something pops up, you're watching your favorite program, and then a commercial comes up, and it's like, ooh, you know. But you have the remote control. Change it. Sometimes my kids, when we're watching a movie, they hand me the remote control. And I sit there, and I'm like, and sometimes I, I don't know techie-wise. I'm, I'm sitting there going like this. I said, let's everybody turn your head. <laughs> Redirect it. But we have this opportunity that God has promised to give us peace, but yet we got to put it into practice to learn how to take our thoughts captive to the lordship of, and kingship of Jesus, that we learn how to cast our anxiety and fear upon the Lord, that we learn how to, when we have an anxious thought, that we bring it before God and we take it in our hands and say, God, this, this is what I'm afraid of, God. I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about this, God. It's, it's right now causing fear and anxiety in my heart. I, and, and God, I want to take this right now and I, I turn it into a prayer, God. I don't know what the future holds. Maybe, I mean, do you, know, do you want to know what I'm kind of, concerned about i mean these are kind of things that, that anxious thoughts okay ants we have carpenter ants that in the summer i saw them going up my my side wall into my roof and i'm like do i have ants up in my roof isn't that stupid <laughs> it's not stupid but carpenter ants are bad I just need to crawl up in that attic and look around. <laughs> Instead, you know what I've done? I, I, ah, it's an anxious thought. I'm going to bring it before the Lord. It's not that you don't do something about it, but it means that you bring it before the Lord and you learn and you sometimes have to take it, put it into practice. 
I think one of the thing is, as we are in this crazy time in life, in this season, this could be life-changing for some of us. It could be life-transforming. But are you willing to put it into practice? Are you willing to do the work that it takes to do the heavy lifting of bringing it on a constant basis? Redirecting. Some of us need to change some train tracks today of how we process anxiety and fear. And the Apostle Paul saying, this is, this is the way to do it, to experience the peace of God, the peace that Jesus promised, the fact that he's with us. Isn't that comforting to know that he's with us? No matter what you're going through, he's always with you. He'll never leave us or forsake us. We're going to wrap our time up as we uh, come to this place why don't we stand at this time and invite the worship team to come up. But maybe some of you today are experiencing great anxiety and fear. It's been consuming you. Some of you are worrying about the future. Some of you are worrying about your children. Some of you are worrying about uh, COVID. Uh, different things that uh, have been paralyzing you deeply been putting you in a place right now where you, you do not have the peace of Christ ruling in your heart. And like the Apostle Paul said in verse 9, whatever you have seen, whatever you have heard in my life, put it into practice. We say, follow my example. And then he lays out the example and he gives his secret. If you could call it a secret, he, he lets it out and says, this is the way you you need to process it. So I want to challenge us that we would process. Think about it. If you did not know the Lord, what would that be like? I would be a mess if it wasn't for the Lord. Oh, God's still working on me and I'm still, those anxious thoughts still come my way and they still sometimes can paralyze me. But I, I have learned to be able to lay it before God, to bring it, this worry and anxiety and fear and translated as a prayer to God and cast my cares upon him because I know without a shadow of a doubt that he cares for me. That peace that Jesus offers can be yours. But you need to put into practice the way to take the mind, the thoughts, and bring them to the Lord Jesus, those anxious thoughts, those fears that you're experiencing in your life that are keeping you up and awake at night, that don't allow you to experience the peace of God. And I want you to do something this morning as we close. I want you right now think about the thing. If you could, if you could think about the, the anxious thought or the fear, the greatest fear that you're experiencing right now. I want you to, I, can, can you think of that right now? I want you to hold it. A a imagine holding that in your hands. Just hold it in your hands like a fist. Grab a hold of them. Grab a, grab a hold of those anxious thoughts, those fears that are paralyzing you. And whatever it is, have you identified it? Now I want you to lift it up to the Lord in, in a prayer. I want you to release, open up your hands and release it to him. Just let it go. Bring it before him. And I want you to thank him. Begin to thank him for, for, for what he's going to do. Begin to thank him for his goodness. Begin to thank him that he's got control. Bring that as a supplication before him. Be specific. Lay it at his feet. Cast, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you so deeply. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, we cast our cares upon you, Jesus, because we know that you care for us. We can know and knowledge, but we want to experience it, God. I pray that you would set your people free from anxiety and fear. We lay the future before us, God. Uh, you know the future, God. And Lord, I pray, Jesus, whatever that fear is, God, that's, or maybe fears, we lay them at your feet. We cast them on your shoulders, Lord Jesus. And we want to thank you that you care for us deeply, Lord. So as we close this with worship song, Lord, I pray that we would sense your peace.
Let's worship him right now. And begin to thank him. Begin to thank him. You deserve the glory.